live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and Intel, along with its ecosystem partners. Oh, welcome back inside the sands here as we continue our coverage here live on theCUBE of AWS reInvent 2019. Absolutely jam-packed aisles, great educational sessions, and one of the feature presenters uh, now joins us as well, Dave Vellante, John Walls, with Paul Seville, who's the SVP of Core Network and Technology Solutions at CenturyLink. Paul, good to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you, John. So see you. you just finished up, right? We'll get into that in just yeah. a little bit. First off, just give me your impression of what's going on here and the energy and the vibe that you're getting. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's very high energy here. You know, there's a lot of new things that, that are emerging in terms of the applications that we're seeing, the use cases for the cloud, and of course, exciting stuff happening around edge compute with the announcement of AWS with the Outpost launch. All right, so, so, let's, so we'll jump into edge. I mean, um, everybody has a different idea, right? Yeah. So yours, I mean, when, if you define the edge, at least how do you see it? Yeah, it's very simple uh, definition of how we see the edge. It's putting compute very close to the point of interaction. And the interaction can be with humans, or the interaction can be with devices, or other uh, electronics that need, to, that need to be controlled, or that need to communicate. But the point is getting that, that compute as close as possible to it from a performance standpoint that's needed. So we heard that a lot from Andy Jassy, I think yesterday, right? Yes. Bringing the compute to the data. I mean, with all due respect, that's like, he was talking about like it was a new concept, right? We've been hearing this right. now for, for quite some time. Um, so, talk more about how you see the edge evolving. I mean, look, I, I give a lot of credit to Amazon because you know, they used to not talk about hybrid. I, I predict a couple years or two they'll be talking about multi-cloud, guarantee yeah. it, right? Because yeah. that's what customers are doing. So they respond to customers. So, at the same time, um, I, th I like their edge strategy because it's all about developers. It's, it's yeah. about you know, infrastructure's code at the edge, but you guys are about, you know, moving that data, you know, yeah. and, 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 or not necessarily, uh -huh. bringing the compute to that edge. So how do you see the edge evolving? Yeah, so the, the reason this whole trend is happening is because what's happening with the new technologies that are enabling uh, a whole new set of applications out there. Things like uh, what's going on with artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, virtual reality, those, the robotics control, those things are uh, basically driving this need to place compute as close as possible to that point of interaction. The problem is that when you do that, costs go up. And that's the conundrum that we've kind of been in because when compute gets housed at the customer premise, you know, in a home, in a business, in an enterprise, then that's the most expensive real estate that, that there is. And you can't get the economies of scale that's there. The only other choice to date has been the public cloud. And that can be uh, hundreds or thousands of miles away and these new applications that require really tight control and interaction uh, can't operate in that kind of environment, and yet it's too expensive to run those applications at the very edge, at the, at the premise itself. So that's why this middle ground now of, of placing compute nearby where it can serve many locations or must be housed more cost effectively so, is okay. in place. So you got the speed of light problem. So right. You too, too far, so you deal with that latency by, by making the the compute proximate to the data, exactly. but it doesn't have to be like right next to it. Correct. Uh, but but what are we talking distance wise? It's that to be synchronous distance or? Yeah, we, when we think of the distance, we think about it in terms of milliseconds of delay from where the edge device, the, the thing that needs to interact with the computer or the application needs to interact with. And we have not seen any applications that from the customers we talk to that really get beyond or need tighter than five milliseconds of delay. Now, that's one way. So if we get into that range of placing compute within five milliseconds of the, of the edge interaction, the device that it needs to interact with, that is enough to meet the, some of the most tightest requirements that we've seen around robotics control, video analytics, and, and other okay, applications. So I, I can ship code to the data, but the problem is if it needs to be real time, Right. It's still too much, of, uh, it's, it's too much latency. Right. And that's the problem that you're solving. That's right. Okay, correct. Right. So, so you, what's what you were talking about, you know, why milliseconds matter. That's right. But, but, so give me some examples, if you will, then, about you know, why, why five matters more than 10, or five matters more than eight, or 20, or whatever. I mean, right. Because we're talking about such an infinitesimal difference, but yet it does matter in some respects. It does, so. because 
So give, I'll give you an example of uh, robotics, for example, robotics control. You know, that is one of the things that requires the most uh, tight latency requirement. Because, and it depends upon the robotics itself. It's, if it's a, a machining tool that's working on a lathe, then that doesn't require as tight of response time to the controller as say, a scanning device that is real time pushing things around very fast and doing an optical read on it to make the decision about, how, about where it pushes the, the device next. That type of interaction and control requires a much tighter latency performance and that's why you get start, you start to see these ranges. But as I said, we're, we're not seeing anything below that kind of five millisecond type of range. From so the other thing that's changing, and help me understand this, is, yeah, okay, so you're moving the, the compute closer to the data, which increases cost, and I want to understand how you're addressing that. Um, well, maybe one of the ways you address it is because you're bringing the cloud model, the operating model to the data. So that's right. patches, security patches, maintenance, things like that are, are reduced. Is that how you're addressing cost? Yeah, that is part of it. And that's why the AWS Outpost is very interesting because it is really a complete instance of AWS that is in a much smaller form factor that you can deploy very close to that point of interaction, close to the customer, to the customer premise. And that enables customers to leverage the uh, pretty much the full power of AWS in engaging with those devices and coding to those devices and, and dropping those applications close now, to those Now devices. you lose the multi-tenant aspect, is that right? Or it, that not is necessarily? For now, but, from but our understanding of Outpost, it's a single tenant device coming right. out the gate, but ultimately it's going to be a multi-tenant device. Yeah, okay, so near term it's easier to manage, but it's, it's you know, multi-instance, I guess. Yes. Uh, and then you know, over time, maybe you can share that, that resource. It's yeah, still not going to... The interesting thing is that even though it's a single tenant device, there are still many great use cases because even a single tenant device in set in one market could serve multiple enterprise locations. So it still has that kind of a sense of scale because you can serve, as long as it's, the, it's one enterprise, it can serve many locations off of that one, that one device. Okay, so you don't get the massive economies of scale, but you're yeah. opening up use cases that never existed before. That's right. right. But what about what do you do with when the data supply basically is, you know, you also make a data scale, uh -huh. and, it, and edge devices creating that much more data, all of a sudden speed becomes a little more challenging exactly. because you're taking in a lot more information, trying to right. process it in different ways, apps are feeding off of that. So all of a sudden you have a, a much more complex challenge because it's not static, right? This is a very dynamic environment. That's right, yeah, and, it, and it, there's a very big trend that's happening now, which is that data is being created at the edge and it's staying at the edge for a whole number of reasons. You know, to, in, in the old world, you would pretty much collect data and you'd ship it off to the centralized data center or to the public cloud to be housed there, and that's today, that's where 80% of data resides. But there's a big shift happening where that data now needs to reside at the deep edge because it needs to have that fast interaction with something that it's, that it's working with or because of government regulations that are now coming in that are having much stricter tolerances around you have to know exactly where your data is and it can't cross state lines, it can't you know, get out of a certain security zone, the things like that are, are forcing companies now to keep that massive amount of data uh, in a very understood, known, localized position. So, so you got to act on it in real time. Yes. Um, some of it will go back to the cloud, but are, are, are you seeing folks persist the data at the edge? Or not so much? Persistent data? Are they, are you, do people want to store it at the edge as well? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, people want to store it at the edge where, where it's going to uh, have a lot of interaction. So if you're running a, uh, if you're running a chemical plant, uh, you may not need to have access to a lot of data outside that chemical plant, but you, you're intensively analyzing that data in the chemical plant, and you don't want to ship it off someplace centrally a thousand miles away to, to be accessed from there. It needs to be acted on locally, and that's why edge compute, this movement toward edge compute is really building and becoming stronger. Talk about your tech. You know, what's, what's the real value of what you do? You're obviously reducing latencies, you got to secure all this sure. stuff, but maybe double click yeah, on so that. Yeah, so CenturyLink has, brings a number of tools to help in this whole space. So, the, the, first of all, the network that we provide that can tie it all together from the enterprise location to the, to the edge location where compute can be housed, all the way back to the public cloud core. We have a network that spans the entire US, fiber all over the place, and we can use those low latency fiber optic connections to chain those those areas together in the most optimal fashion to get the kind of performance that you need to handle these distributed compute environments. 
We also bring compute technology itself. We have our own variety of edge compute where we can build custom edge compute solutions for customers that meet their very specific spec requirements that can be dedicated to them. We can incorporate AWS's compute technology as well. And we have, um, we have IT services and skilled people, uh, thousands of employees that are focused on this space that build these solutions together for customers that tie together the public cloud resources, the edge compute resources, the network resources, the wireless connectivity capabilities that's needed on customer premise, and the management solutions to tie it all together in that very mixed environment. We were just on a session with Teresa Carlson who runs public sector for AWS. We, I was telling her that I sat in a session, Marty Walsh, the mayor of Boston, has got this big smart city initiative going on. I know that's one of the use cases that you're working on. Maybe talk about that a little bit and maybe some of the other interesting use cases that you're seeing. Yeah, that's right. Definitely smart cities are a big, are a big use case though. The one, and we're, we are actually actively working on a number of them. I would say that those use, the smart city use cases tend to move very slowly because you're talking about municipalities and yeah. a long decision making cycle. I'll tell you though, we've there's seen- a, There's a 50 year plan he put forward. True, yeah, yeah true. true. So, uh, yeah. But the use cases that we're really seeing the most traction with are interestingly is uh, robotics is, uh, is a really big one and uh, video analytics is another big one. So we're, we're actually deploying edge use case solutions right now in those scenarios. The robotics one is a great one because those devices need to be, uh, those robotic devices need to be controlled within a really tight uh, millisecond tolerance. And, but the compute needs to be housed in a very, it's much more reliable economic uh, location. The video analytics piece is a really interesting one that we're seeing very, very uh, big demand for because retailers have now reached the point with the technology where they can do things like they can, they can figure out by doing video analytics whether somebody is acting suspiciously in the store. And we're hearing that they, can, they think they can now cut uh, thievery out of retail locations dramatically by using video analytics. And when you talk about big savings to the bottom line of a company, Absolutely. that makes a big savings to them. So that's, those are very two good use cases we're seeing that are real today. You know, one of the other things you were talking about earlier was about the, the disappearance of, of compute divide. That's right. So where'd yeah. it go? I mean, what, what, what's yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, I like to say that in the old days, you know, if you've been around long enough, like I know you're old enough because <laughs> oh, I was a, a kid watching you on TV when I was a little kid. He knows that from Tulsa days. But the, no, uh, way back. When we, Guilty. When we, got, <laughs> when we got out of college. How's that make you feel? Uh, <laughs> Really old. <laughs> when we got out of college, I John, everything was in a mainframe, right? right? It was essentially, you had, when you went to work, you had a terminal and everything was housed centrally. Right. Then we went to distributed, where a client server model, where you, everybody was working on desktops and, and a lot of the compute was on the desktops and very little went back to a mainframe. Then we made the shift to the cloud, where we pushed as much in the centralized location as we can. Um, to, and so we shifted way back to centralized. That's the compute divide I'm talking about, goes that big shift from decentralized to centralized, decentralized. Now, we're actually moving to a new world where that pendulum swing, that compute divide is, is disappearing because compute isn't most economically stored in any one location, it's everywhere. It's going to be at the IOT edge, it's going to be at the premise, it's going to be in market locations that were centralized, it's going to be in the public cloud core, it's going to be all around us. And that's what I mean by the, by the disappearance of the compute divide. And, and you know, I, I want to uh, come back on that. You talk about a pendulum, a lot of people talk about the pendulum swings, mainframe and distributed now. A lot of people say it's the pendulum is swinging back, but you just described it differently. It's, it's a ubiquitous matrix now where that's compute right. is everywhere. That's where you hear this term fog computing, the idea of the fog now. It's not the cloud that you can see off in the distance. It's just everywhere around, it's around you and that's how compute, well, it's, we can start to think it, about it, how I, compute I, I think is. I first heard that term, like, I don't know, eight years ago. I'm like, what the heck is this? It was ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. But now it's really starting to, to show. I mean, this is sort of new expansion of what we know as cloud, yeah. sort of re redefining. Yes, exactly. And Edge 5G, that's you know, another big piece of it. You know, Amazon's obviously excited about that with, I think they call it wavelength, right? Uh, what do you see for, for 5G? How's that going to affect this whole equation? Yeah, I think 5G is going to have a, has, have a number of um, edge applications and it's primarily going to be around the mobile space. You know, it's the, the advantage of it is that it increases bandwidth and it, and it supports mo mobility uh, and it allows for a little bit higher resilience because they can take the part of the spectrum and make sure that they're carving it out and dedicating it for particular applications that are there. 
but I tell you that the, um, you know, 5G gets a lot of attention in terms of being how edge compute is going to roll out, but we're not seeing that at all. Edge compute is available today, and uh, that we're providing those edge compute solutions through our fiber optic networks. What we're seeing is that every enterprise that we're talking to wants fiber into their, into their enterprise location. Because once you have fiber there, that's going to be the most secure, reliable, and scalable solution. Fiber can, can effectively scale as big as any customer could ever consume the bandwidth. And they know that once they get fiber into, that into their location, that they're good for, for the future because they can totally scale with that. And that's how we're deploying edge solutions today. Well, Paul, uh, I know you got a plane to catch and you got to go, but after that age comment, we're going to keep you here for another oh, okay. hour. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, thanks again. Hey, it's great Always seeing you again. Always good to see you. Thanks okay, for joining us. All right. All right, Paul, hang on, hang oh. on. <laughs> we're about to say goodbye to Paul. Okay. Now we will. <laughs> we have us reinvent. 2019 coverage continues right here on theCUBE. Right.